Welcome to the second in a series of three short webinars for veterans. My name is Rex Dufour, and I'll be hosting this in the next webinar on October 26, which will be investing in your soils. Uh, I head up the NCATS California office in Davis. Also, we're planning a week-long arm-to-farm in-person training in San Diego area in late April 2022, so stay tuned to the arm-to-farm page. Um, just wanted to say a few words about NCAT and ATRA. NCAT is the nonprofit that I work for, uh, the National Center for Appropriate Technology, and ATRA is the National Sustainable Ag Information Service. NCAT is a nonprofit organization with several offices scattered around the country. Our biggest project is ATRA, the National Sustainable Ag Information Service. And this is the homepage of ATRA. Uh, it's a really good resource for farmers. You can talk to a live person with any question related to organic or sustainable production or marketing of crops and livestock. We run a couple toll-free lines. You can see the English uh, language um, toll free line up there. We also have a Spanish up in the upper right, Espanol uh, website, and we also have a Spanish uh, toll free line. Uh, at least half of our staff are farmers or former farmers and all have long experience in organic and sustainable agriculture. And this website has hundreds of resources on a wide range of topics in formats ranging from we have publications, podcasts, videos, webinars, uh, searchable, searchable databases, and blogs. And it's especially useful for beginning farmers or farmers with um, a few years experience under their belt. Uh, it'll help you maybe avoid some mistakes. And so I wanna thank um, who's funding this webinar, uh, the California Association of Resource Conservation Districts, and they're funneling money from the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And thank you, uh, CARCD and NRCS. And now I'd like to introduce the speakers for today. Um, very happy to have Andy Pressman uh, from our New Hampshire office. Andy has been with NCAT since 2007 helping farmers in the fields of whole farm planning and small scale intensive farm farming systems, organic crop certification, urban agriculture and community food systems. He's got a master's degree in sustainable systems from Slippery Rock University with an emphasis on agroecology and permaculture design. He has extensive experience in market farming and in working with appropriately scaled tools and equipment for the small farm. And Andy and his family also operate Foggy Hill Farm, a small diversified farm and CSA located in Jaffrey, New Hampshire. Our second speaker today is a colleague of mine uh, in the California office, Omar Rodriguez. Um, after receiving his degree in international ag development from UC Davis, Omar journeyed to South America as a Peace Corps volunteer, where he worked with small farmers to encourage diversification, business development, alternative technologies, and reforestation. In the years since and prior to joining NCAT, he managed several farmers markets in the Bay Area. And previous to that, he worked on an 80 acre permaculture farm in Montana. Omar uses his skills, knowledge, and Spanish fluency to reach farmers within the Latino community. And I would add that he's been our point person um, organizing uh, the annual Latino farmer conferences that we hold here in California. Um, and we've been doing that for the past six years now. So anyway, with that, um, I'd like to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Andy Pressman. Right. Thank you, Rex, and, and thanks for the great introduction. And hello, everyone. I hope you're, you're doing well. Um, as we sort of transition slides here for a moment, um, maybe you can take a moment to grab a piece of paper and a pencil. I have a couple questions uh, hoping you can jot down. And Margo, I'm, I'm sorry, do we want to launch the first few 
questions, poll questions? Yes, and I just want to make sure. Can you see your opening slide? I can, thank okay. you. Okay, all right, I'll go ahead and launch the first poll. All right, so we have just a, a few poll questions here just to get to know you all a little bit virtually um, and to see where you're at within your farming uh, ambitions, whether you're currently farming or in the process of maybe starting a farm. Uh, so the first question here, you can go ahead and answer. Uh, are you currently a commercial farmer or rancher? And the second question is how long have you been farming? And there are four questions on the poll. So you might have to scroll down to see uh, the next two questions. All right, thanks. I didn't know that. So the third question is, um, <laughs> what are you producing on your farm types of enterprises, uh, whether it's vegetables, fruit and nuts, agronomic crops or field crops, livestock, bees, flowers or other. And then the fourth question, uh, which really pertains to what we want to sort of dive into today is about scales of production. So what size is your operation? And so far, it looks like we've got folks less than an acre all the way up to more than 40 acres. Wait, the diversity. We all hear another, another moment. And hopefully you all can see the results. Oh, share results. I just shared results. So hopefully everybody can see the, those results. All right. So it looks like most of you on today um, are currently farming uh, with a range of less than a year, um, all the way up to about 10 years which uh, according to the USDA is the definition of a beginning farmer, 10 years or less. So that's good to know. Uh, we've got some vegetable producers, fruit and nuts, agronomic livestock, bees, flowers, and others. So all of the above. And as I mentioned with scale, we are less than an acre uh, with some folks on the call who are over 40 acres in production. All right. Well, thank you so much for answering those questions. I'm going to Switch here real quickly. All right, so um, I'm here today to share a little bit about my experience in uh, both on, uh, working on my farm as well as with farmers I work with cross country uh, through my role with uh, NCAT, National Center for Appropriate Technology, uh, and to focus on tools and equipment for the small farm. And really what I wanna do today is dive into more about the decision-making process of how we utilize tools and equipment on our farms. Uh, we'll, we'll get into specific tools and equipment as well, uh, both at the hand scale and sort of moving up the mechanization. But um, I really want to focus on, you know, how we make these decisions and how they impact uh, really our, our cash flow and, and quality of life that we're managing towards. So uh, next slide, Margo. Margo's going to advance slides here for me. So um, Rex did a great job talking about um, our organization as well as the ATRA Sustainable Agriculture Program and about the Arm to Farm Program, um, which is uh, why we're here today through um, the Arm to Farm virtual sessions for the West Coast. Uh, so just a little bit, uh, Rex did a great job about my background too, but uh, as he mentioned, um, I have a background in small scale farm design uh, and I work uh, closely within that with intensive crop production design systems, uh, which definitely leads into my passion for tools and equipment. Um, and Rex also mentioned, uh, I do some work with whole farm planning. And so uh, within this slide, just to sort of introduce myself, um, I have that at the center because I think as we think about our systems and design for our farms, um, and as we sort of go down that path and discussion of, of tools and equipment, it really does come back to filtering through these questions related to whole farm planning and, and setting a holistic goal for ourselves. And so throughout this presentation, you may hear me talk a lot about managing towards our goals. And I think that's really important as we think about our tool 
and equipment selection, as well as how we design our systems um, with, with the tools and equipment in, in perspective, um, we really have to sort of use this filter of what are we managing towards and, and really coming down to what's, what's the quality of life we want for not only ourselves and our family, um, but our community as well. So I think, uh, you know, as, as sort of we, as we make decisions at any aspect within our farm um, operation, it, it really comes down to utilizing this filter and understanding what are we managing towards. Next slide. And as Rex, uh, Rex mentioned as well, I, I do manage a small farm with my family uh, in Southern New Hampshire called Foggy Hill Farm. Um, a lot of my work involves helping farmers scale up production, um, which is really interesting because my, uh, with this farm, which we started in 2011, maybe 2012, um, is about scaling back. So, so sort of going through that whole farm planning process, understanding what we're managing towards, the quality of life we wanted for, for ourselves and our family, um, so our story is really about scaling back, uh, which really has created a, a neat lens for us in terms of decision making and how we set up our systems and, and utilize um, our investments and capitalization efforts, um, to which um, I'll show you here some pictures of the last tractor I sold in, in 2011, um, which was just a, a game changer for me to understand our expenses and cash flow related to tools and equipment and how much money we were really spending on, on maintenance and, and the difference that changed in terms of our cash flow um, once we sort of changed um, out of that system and that scale. So um, most of our food uh, stays within about 10 mile radius of our farm. We're primarily operate as a community supported agriculture program. Uh, we do sell to a few restaurants and uh, one local market. Um, but if I really wanted to access what I would say is sort of the, the thriving California farmers markets um, or West Coast markets, that would require uh, for me to travel to somewhere like Boston, uh, which is over an hour's drive plus traffic. Um, so that's sort of, as we sort of went through the whole farm planning process, we realized that's you know a lot of time off farm away from our families. Um, and then looking more at the sort of localized farmers markets, um, you know, they weren't, they were a lot of time off farm and, and not a lot of, not a lot of sales. Um, so we've actually had to adjust and really understand, you know, who are our clients, who are our markets and, and how do we manage towards them? Uh, to which, next slide. Just to sort of paint a picture of, of the, the Northeast landscape, if you're not familiar with New England um, and sort of want to tie this into sort of the West Coast and what you're experiencing. Um, we, we are definitely on the small scale side of, of agriculture and food production. Uh, that being said, we have a thriving local food system. People want to know where their food comes from. They want to know their farmers and they want to support them and keep those dollars in their, in their local economy. So this is a picture of uh, my county. Uh, to the left, you can see Interstate 91. That's actually Vermont. Uh, and then at the bottom of the, the picture, you can see Winchington uh, and a dotted line. That's Massachusetts. So I'm right in the corner um, and get to, to uh, sort of both states relatively within a few minutes. Um, but, but all those sort of bubbles are, are small farms in my area. Um, and so it sort of just paints this landscape of, yeah, we don't have big farms here, but we have a lot of small farms. And Margo, if I think uh, if you hit enter, maybe a uh, animation. Yeah. So, uh, and just to point out, um, as we think about the scale of production, it's important to know that we're really not defining scale by uh, size or by acreage. Um, so, you know, I could be on one acre and someone on the West Coast could be on 100 acres, but we can all call ourselves a small scale farmer because it's really, according to the USDA and, and there's an IRS definition as well, um, but it's based on sales and gross sales. And currently the definition of a small farm is gross sales under $250,000. Um, that number went up about 10 years ago. It used to be $100,000, but um, sort of just to think about this idea of now that uh, it's $250,000 in gross sales per year, that, that's a big, big bubble of, of, of farmers all included in that, in that pool. So uh, a lot to think about there uh, in terms of scales of production and that we can all consider ourselves a small scale farmer. Um, but sort of tying it back into to where I'm at in New Hampshire, um, over 80% of New Hampshire farms gross under 25,000. So again, we're not big farms, um, but there's a lot of us and um, just a, a really neat community sort of based agriculture system. All right, so next slide. 
So as we sort of dive into um, tools and equipment and sort of the decision-making process, um, I, I wanna start by really understanding what we're talking about and also defining it as scales of production. Um, so if you could just take a moment, a uh, question for you all, and Margo, you can uh, hit the enter button. Um, first, just think about what are, the, what are the one of the best buys for those of you that are farming um, that you feel you've made for your farm in terms of tools, equipment, and I'll even throw in infrastructure. And Margo, if you want to hit enter again, I'll also ask what are one of the worst buys that you've made for your farm? And then uh, one more time, Margo, which will be uh, anything sort of on the horizon that you're looking to, to purchase. All right, well, uh, I see a few folks in the chat have put uh, some of their answers. So um, I can start reading through them, but feel free to use the chat or unmute yourselves. I don't, I think Rex, that's an option. If folks wanna share, um, you can go ahead and I'd love to hear best buys, worst buys, as well as what you're thinking uh, for the future. And in the chat, we have, uh, a greenhouse from Nicole. We have a small tractor from Gray. Tractor and hoop house from Sherry. We have an electric fence for deer. We have a farm from Jackie. I'm assuming that's one of your best buys, not your worst buy. Uh, access to land for William. The Dibbler from Nicole. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about that here today. Anne's looking for a mobile chicken processing, a mobile chicken tractor. We have Lori with uh, a tractor as well. Jim, who uh, appreciates having a barn. All right, and we have Melissa who's focused on no-till production and using a roller crimper, which we'll talk a little bit as, about as well. Lori's looking for a high tunnel in the future. And a walk behind tractor for Jim. And Nicole has recently bought a walk behind tractor. All right. Well, I'm um, just looking at the, the pictures here, um, sort of as I think about these questions for, for our farm. Um, the upper picture of a uh, Farmall 140, that's the, the last tractor I sold in 2011. Uh, this tractor, I went down to Pennsylvania to buy, and um, while I was really, really pleased with it and very familiar with Farmalls, um, I think the mistake I made here was this tractor was just on the verge of being a restoration project versus ready for field production. So I had to put a lot of time and energy and money into to getting it more field ready um, versus the sort of restoration project. Um, and then the bottom picture, it's kind of hard to see, but that is a um, smaller scale manure spreader. Uh, and I think about here, tool and equipment design. Um, as we scaled back, I was really looking for a way for materials handling on our farm, which is the sort of the big missing piece on our farm right now. It's the weak link um, in terms of uh, moving moving things around the farm, whether it's compost or, or plants uh, or even um, harvest baskets, um, to which we do utilize our neighbor's tractor, which has a front end loader, which to me is sort of the, the big game changer uh, in, in tools and equipment is having that front end loader. But um, having this, this compost spreader, I thought would really be ideal because it can attach to a garden tractor. Um, you don't need a three point hitch or anything. Um, but I soon found out that uh, even within this simple design, uh, it did not work well at all. I could move about two feet and then it would be clogged and uh, not work. Uh, and if you look at the sort of the wheels, uh, they have the grooves in them. Those would get compacted with compost and it didn't matter how dry the compost I was using uh, was, it still just got compacted and couldn't catch on the, uh, the drum to spread the compost. Uh, so this thing is uh, 
sort of just you know sitting out back to which I, I do know there's a lot of other uh, compost spreader and manure spreaders out there now, particularly for ATVs and, and garden tractor scale, which I'm, I'm starting to look into. But, um, you know, just thinking about these questions and thinking about what we've purchased and, and how that's affected our cash flow and management, uh, these, these sort of tool, two, two tools come to my mind. All right, so next slide there, Margo. Thank you. So before we sort of dive into um, looking at specific tools and understanding the sort of the decision-making process, I think it's important to share a little bit about uh, the history of, of how we got to where we are today within what's out there, what's available and how we use them uh, in terms of their design. And this really ties into our organization, the National Center for Appropriate Technology and, and sort of how we were formed in the early seventies. Uh, so I think to start is, is sort of defining this term of what is an appropriate technology, which is, is part of our organization's name. Um, I think it's a sort of confusing term, but uh, we'll talk about the history of behind it here in a moment as well. But to me, uh, as we define it, it's really one fitting the local conditions. It's being inexpensive. They're simple to make and use and, and generally made from local resources. They tend to not deplete natural resources and they create fulfilling jobs and workplaces. And so I have four sort of examples here on the slide. On the upper left is a compost tumbler um, we got to see at an urban farm in uh, Washington, DC. And this tumbler was made out of bicycle and skateboard parts. As you can see the, uh, the tracks and wheels on the bottom there of the, of the drum. The bottom left-hand picture is a newer type uh, open platform cultivating tractor called the Ogun. Um, this design was very popular in the late 40s, early 50s for vegetable cultivation. And that sort of went away, which we'll talk about here in a moment, uh, up until more recently. And now there's, there's quite a few um, manufacturers in the country who are starting to create these open wheel tractors again. What's interesting about the Ogun is it's an open platform. Um, so it's designed to be made off, uh, from off the, off the, off the shelf parts, uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, so really what you're buying with this tractor is $250 to get the plans. Uh, and then you can take those plans to a local fabricator um, and local stores and get all your parts. Um, so really neat model and design, uh, again, open platform that, uh, you know, focuses on being an appropriate technology. In the upper uh, right-hand corner is a cool bot. Some of you may be familiar with this device. It's a little unit that connects to a window air conditioning unit and it can trick the window air conditioning unit into thinking it's a cooler. So instead of buying a refrigeration unit that can be quite costly for a farm, uh, this gives you an opportunity to use a, a window air conditioning unit and to be able to frame out a cooler, um, perhaps wherever you'd like on your farm, whether it's in your barn, in a garage, or even standalone. Um, but again, another, example of an appropriate technology. And then the bottom right-hand picture is the tilther. Um, this unit is sold from Johnny Selected Seeds up in Maine, but the idea here is uh, that farms tend to have um, cordless drills. And so we can create equipment and tools that operate off of them. Um, there's a few other tools we can showcase today as well, but this is a, a shallow tiller um, that allows you to just use a, a battery operated drill. Um, to sort of do some quick uh, bed preparation uh, before planting. All right, next slide. So as um, I mentioned sort of the history behind appropriate technologies, I think it's important because it really plays into this aspect of where we are today within tools and equipment for the small farm in this country. And it starts with um, the gentleman on the left-hand side there, E.F. Schumacher. Uh, perhaps you may be familiar with his name or a book he wrote in the, the early 1970s called Small is Beautiful. Uh, and that is a foundational piece, I would say, of our organization uh, as these sort of international centers for appropriate technology started to open up. Uh, we, we sort of became the, the center for this country. Um, but E.F. Schumacher was, was a, an economist uh, and really focused on what I would say as sort of the values of, of local agriculture and local economies that we speak of today. So investing in your farms, investing in local businesses helps to keep those dollars in the local economy. But what's important is E.F. Schumacher really noticed this uh, disappearing middle. Um, so he, he noticed that things were 
getting much bigger on scale and the infrastructure and equipment was related to that, but we were sort of missing the small scale, middle scale piece, particularly related to agriculture. Uh, so things were sort of tending towards either going more towards the garden or homestead scale or the large scale agriculture, but there was this big missing piece in the middle. And a lot of that relates to at the same time, uh, we had a secretary of agriculture for the USDA who was uh, really focused on, on larger scale agriculture and sort of uh, larger scale production and, and was famous for saying, get big or get out. Um, you may be familiar with uh, Earl Butts was his name. And so there's sort of two different aspects of um, how to grow food and how to feed a growing population. Um, both were happening at the same time, but sort of coming from different angles. And um, I think that I like that chart in the middle there because uh, it really shows you know, where we're sort of at in terms of scales of production. And I, uh, you know, I'd love to sort of update this. I haven't found a more updated chart, but uh, my understanding from the USDA is these numbers have not changed much at all. Uh, so really we see most of the growth in larger scale agriculture. So those, those policies and um, programs that were being created from the USDA in the seventies still continue to play a critical role in our tool and equipment um, access that we have today. Uh, so in, in my experience, you know, a lot of what's missing currently in this country is being manufactured and fabricated overseas. Um, and in, in trying to reach out to some of these companies and trying to get access to some of this equipment here in this country, um, they, they really don't have an interest in bringing it here because we're still really focused on this bigger model. Um, I will say that, that that's definitely changing now. We see a lot more interest in the smaller mid-scale agriculture as well as local fabrication. So a lot of uh, more interest in local farmers and fabrication shops focused on tool and equipment design. Uh, these are popping up everywhere. I know even in California and the West Coast, this is pretty popular. So I think this is a really exciting time for tools and equipment as we're sort of seeing this regrowth or reborn component of tools and equipment uh, while noting that, you know, for the most part, uh, it's still, still on the bigger end for this country. Sort of getting back to, to, to sort of my location, um, I'm fortunate I live in an area where there is a lot of older equipment from the 40s, 50s, and 60s geared towards smaller scale agriculture. And there's a lot of parts available as well. So we tend to see, at least in, in my region, uh, a lot of older equipment that's still being heavily utilized for production agriculture. Um, with, like I said, access to parts is pretty simple. Um, that being said, most of the equipment that we do see costs more now than it did 40, 50, 60 years ago. Um, so in terms of cash flow, it could be an issue, but, but I, I feel like we're, we're in a good place where we at least know we have access to this equipment. Um, but again, you'd, you'd, you'd have to focus on cash flow and, and you know, how much you wanna tinker with this equipment. Um, so hopefully we can continue to see more interest in this scale of production and, and see new, new equipment being not only imported, but fabricated right here. All right, next slide. So sort of bringing this all together, what I wanna to focus on today uh, and now understanding sort of the, the history and sort of where we're at with, with tools and equipment for this country. I think um, when I think about selecting tools and equipment and where I wanna focus on today is, Mark, you can go ahead and hit enter. Forgot about all these animations, I'm sorry. Uh, is to increase productivity and maximize effort in a safe and reliable way that is cost effective. So when I think about uh, design systems for as related to equipment and, and what I'm looking to purchase, I wanna make sure that it's appropriate to scale and to the type of operation I'm involved with. I wanna make sure that it's appropriate to my skill level as well as the skill level of any employees I have on the farm. And I wanna make sure that it's appropriate to my site, uh, my budget, as well as my ability to use and care for it properly. And so uh, go ahead and hit enter again, Margo. I think within this, it's real important to one, try and design systems or utilize equipment to avoid duplication, as well as being reactive. Uh, I think the more we can be reactive, uh, the less stress we have. I, I would say, unfortunately though, I think if we, we sort of wake up every morning, we go out to our farms and we have a to-do list, we always run into things that are unexpected, whether uh, a fence is, is down or, um, something got in to, and ate a bunch of crops, or maybe better yet, something's in the have a heart trap. Um, but again, just trying to reduce that stress, 
so that we are more efficient and overall uh, things are more cost effective. And you can go ahead and hit enter one more time. I would also add that it's uh, within my goals is to manage for soil health and an increasing biodiversity. So within my tool and equipment selection, I'm, I'm thinking about this as well. But for today, I think uh, we really wanna focus on the decision-making process as related to um, the first goal here. All right, next slide. Okay, so now we have another poll question for you all. And let's see if Margo can bring it up. Okay, so um, I have a question for you all. And that is, let's say you are a new farmer on one acre of mixed vegetables and that you have limited funds. So based on uh, four items I have listed, how would you prioritize your capitalization efforts? Would it be an, a greenhouse for growing transplants or your starts? Would it be a tractor or walk behind tractor to prepare ground or even more? Would it be cold storage to cool and hold produce? Or would it be a delivery vehicle to get to market? We'll give you here a moment to think about this and prioritize your capitalization efforts. Another 10 seconds. All right, Let's see if I can share results. All right, hopefully you all can see that. Uh, but we have, oh, almost half of you saying a greenhouse. Uh, a few of you saying walk behind tractor, a tractor. One person saying a cold storage unit. And a few of you saying a delivery vehicle. Interesting. All right. Well, um, I will just tell you in terms of my farm, uh, sort of how we went through this process, uh, knowing that we had limited funds, our scale of production, one acre of mixed vegetables, um, a greenhouse, we knew we could uh, either hire that out to another local farmer or, or garden center, as well as doing some of the starts uh, within our house under some lights. Um, so that wasn't the first thing we thought of for uh, starting our farm. Uh, going with a tractor, walk behind tractor. We did have a walk behind tractor at the time, but also knew that we could hire this out as well to a neighbor uh, or someone who does custom um, pillage work. Um, so this was again, not a, a big priority for us in terms of purchasing a tractor uh, just to get started on one acre. Um, cold storage to us was, was the one we felt um, received the highest priority. And that's because we felt that we wanted to preserve uh, the product, its nutrition, its taste, its appearance, uh, so that we were able to go to market and get a premium price. And for, for that, we really knew we had to focus on some type of cold storage unit, um, which could be a cool bot, could be a, a refrigeration unit, um, smaller scale. But that sort of leads into the delivery vehicle as well. We knew at this scale, we didn't need um, something separate or big just to get to market that it, at this scale, we could probably use our everyday vehicle. Uh, we didn't need a refrigerated truck or anything. So for us at this time in getting started, uh, our priority went to cold storage. That being said, I think um, as you can see, some of you have every, at least every uh, option was uh, you know prioritized by someone. So I think it's really up to you and in, in your individual situations and, and looking at your systems and, and what you're managing towards on your farm. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And before we go on, I'm just wondering if there's anything on that list you all feel um, should be a top priority effort that was not included. Anything that wasn't there in terms of starting a farm that you think should be your top priority in terms of investing?
All right, we have irrigation and fencing. Both are really good suggestions. Suitable land, soil, and water. Okay. So assuming, uh, you know, if you're diving into these questions, uh, I guess we're assuming you have access to, to land. Um, marketing and business acumen, another great one. So all these are great. And I, and I really like the fencing as well, depending on where you're at. Um, you know, does it make sense to put all this effort into growing crops if deer are just going to come by and, and browse everything? Um, but for me, uh, I'm going to have to agree with irrigation here. And let me see if I can. Yep. Okay, so Margaret, you can go to the next slide. I sort of took this out of the, the poll question because I think um, this, this really should be at the, at the forefront. Um, if you're investing in seed, if you're investing in soil amendments and fertilizers uh, and you don't have access to water, um, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's a big risk, especially if you're just dependent on, on rain. Um, now that being said, I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge the regional differences we have. One, you all on the West Coast uh, experience major drought conditions, wind conditions, um, versus on the East Coast, uh, you know, this year uh, we have just been underwater. Um, July and August, those two months combined, we tend to average about 8.6 inches of rain for the two months. Uh, on our farm, we recorded 30 inches uh, in, in the two months of just rain. Uh, that being said, I would still feel if I was starting a farm this year that my, my priority investment should be irrigation. Uh, again, because I'm investing in everything else that I need to make sure that that system functions um, and that that's dependent on water. So looking at this picture here, I just wanted to put together a slide of, of irrigation and sort of the investments we make on our farm. Um, the upper left, uh, we do use drip irrigation, um, which has just been, uh, you know, definitely a game changer in terms of vegetable production and intensive vegetable production. Uh, to control the amount of water and where it's going is really important. Uh, and then sort of moving into that center slide, um, that is a, a fertigation uh, uh, device so that we can actually feed nutrients through the drip irrigation at the same time as the water. Um, and then this year we actually uh, moved more into overhead water systems on the bottom left hand corner there, um, which is interesting because when I got started in farming, I was taught that uh, overhead watering was not a, a good practice. It could create a lot of disease opportunities. Um, but I think with a lot of these newer technologies, um, particularly with these micro sprinklers, um, they're definitely a game changer. And I feel like farmers are just not so worried about that disease component as they once were, um, which is really interesting. I'm not sure there's been research to show that there's any more or less disease components, but um, these definitely, particularly with greens, have been a, a much more efficient use of water. Um, and really, I think we're going to put in more of these systems uh, over time. And then the pictures on the right, uh, again, something we've implemented this year, which uh, really important, although again, we've had a really wet year, um, but soil moisture monitoring. And um, if you look at the bottom picture, there's two sort of um, PVC pipes sticking out of the ground. Those have sensors in them. Uh, one of them's at six inches deep and one's at 12 inches deep. And so we're recording um, the dryness of the soil to, to help us understand when it's time to irrigate. And so the picture at the top is a, a watermark monitor. Um, that's actually belongs to NRCS. Uh, we're part of a, a research project with them. So that device right there uh, is collecting data and feeding it to a, a database. Um, that's a very expensive unit. So by next year, once um, they take this off our farm, I'll have to buy a uh, smaller device to read, to measure the sensors, uh, which is about $230. But the sensors are about $30 each. And so you can put them all throughout your farm in your high tunnels, greenhouses, and then you just carry your measuring device with you, hook it up to the, to each of the sensors and you can uh, see what your, your rec recorded, recorded measurements are so you know when it's time to irrigate. Again, I just wanted to share this in terms of uh, investments in irrigation, but to me, this is really the, the priority investment um, which then led us into uh, focusing on commercial refrigeration. All right, next slide. So as I mentioned earlier too, we've, we've really got to think about the design and the components related to scale of production. It's, it's really easy to start a farm with just basic hand tools, um, sort of just the overall, nothing specific, but generalized multi-use tools. 
But at some point, I think as we dive into more commercial production, increasing our scales, increasing our markets, um, it, it may require a more focus on specialized tools as well as scaling up to mechanized equipment. And so I think uh, as we think about this in terms of our designs, it's really important to be honest about the resources we have. That includes time, that includes capital for investing in the farm, land, equipment, and our skills for maintaining and utilizing equipment. And I also think we, uh, we, we, we tend to, well, I should say this, I think it's important to, if at all possible, to design our systems with equipment in mind, whether it has to do with how we turn around or if there's fencing, you know, making sure we can utilize these systems within our, our tools and equipment. Um, so we can design our systems, we can then implement them and then operate them. So we actually do the growing and selling towards the end. Uh, that would be an ideal situation. However, cash flow is always critical within farming. So most farmers tend to operate while they're implementing. So I would just say in terms of risk management, the more we can implement without operating, I think the better off we are while acknowledging sort of the reality aspect is we have to operate while we're implementing and designing and putting in these systems. But I think as we think about the design, it's important to focus on labor, uh, how many folks are working on the farm and will have access to tools and equipment, and also to think about the future. Um, so as we design now, we're at a certain scale production, but if we do wanna scale up, uh, it makes a lot more sense to focus on that at the front end uh, versus getting to a certain point and then having to redesign systems to meet your equipment needs as related to your targeted revenue, as well as what you're managing towards. Uh, so one thing I like to point out is, is a sort of an example of this is um, if you're digging a trench to put in a water line, the, the money to dig that trench is the most expensive piece. So while that trench is open, are there other things we can put in in that trench um, while it's open, other utilities, even though if we're not accessing them now, but thinking about that future growth, because again, that money's in the trench. So what can we do while it's open to help us plan for the future? Next slide. So um, Margo, if you can share in the chat, the Word document, um, which is sort of just a general breakdown of scales of production related to tools and equipment for each of those scales of production. And I'd like to point this out just based on understanding if you're at zero to two acres, what sort of required versus three to 10 acres. Um, I would take it with a grain of salt that this is, um, again, just to give you an idea of sort of what's involved based on different scales. While also noting, um, I am in the process of up updating this, this chart. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really good reference tool to understanding scales of production and sort of what's required at that scale to be more efficient and to help manage towards your goals. And looking at this picture here, um, Margo and I had the opportunity to go to Baltimore two weeks ago for a urban to urban farm training uh, with veterans in, in the Maryland, Virginia area. And um, this is a picture I took, I just absolutely love. Um, this is a, an urban farm in Baltimore. And it's one of the first urban farms. Uh, it's been around for over 30 years and just a, a wonderful, wonderful people to meet. Um, but we're looking at their, their field production and we see this tractor there with a, with a plow on it. And uh, just sort of trying to wrap my head around um, sort of that, that plot, that urban plot with also, you know, why is there such a, a, a I would, I would say a big tractor with a plow for, for that small space. Uh, turns out they've been using this tractor for a long time. They actually have a bigger one on the property that they realized was just too big. Um, so uh, they, they tend to utilize this. Uh, while also noting um, the, the farm owners that we met, um, the husband loves to tinker. So I think it's part of his uh, just interest in, in tinkering, but also, you know, efficiency for them. But, you know, to me, it just really didn't, didn't really relate to the scale of production versus having to invest in that tractor. Okay, so next slide. So just sort of giving some examples here of scales of production and sort of where we're at within what's available out there, whether it's still manufactured overseas or it's here. Um, but to me, I think there's this really interesting space between what's available on a tractor scale and how we can get it down to the manual or smaller mechanized scale. And that's that's really starting to, to take hold in this country uh, with a lot of new fabrications and design coming up. Um, so just looking at this picture, 
The top picture is a plastic mulch layer, which also can lay irrigation at the same time. So you can create your bed, lay down the irrigation and put the plastic mulch over it. And then, so we sold that and we scaled back our farm. Uh, so that sort of moved into the upper right-hand picture, which I know California has some pretty strong child labor laws, um, but I'm in New Hampshire. Um, so, you know, we went from tractor scale down to uh, utilizing our kids to help us to, to lay out the plastic, which we knew was, was inefficient and we needed to figure out our, our next plan. Uh, so the bottom left-hand picture was our next investment for laying down plastic mulch. Um, which was for a walk behind tractor, our BCS. Um, so this is a, a device, an implement manufactured by Earth Tools in Kentucky. And I just have to say it, uh, it's very particular to soil type and requires a lot of tinkering and adjusting to get it, to get it honed in right. Um, so I spent a lot of time just trying to, to get it corrected. Um, so it wasn't, we weren't as pleased as we thought we would be with it. Um, and then last year we ended up purchasing uh, the bottom right hand corner is a manual mulch layer that uh, has just been started being imported from Johnny Selected Tools up in Maine. Uh, this is from TerraTech, which is out of France. And so this unit requires two people to pull it down a bed. Uh, again, it can lay down drip irrigation and plastic mulch at the same time and create sort of a, a raised bed. Uh, and so we had a, a much better success with this this year uh, versus going with the mechanized one for the walk behind tractor. Although I will say, I think again, it relates back to scale and that if, uh, if we have to increase our rows or take on more rows that at some point it may be too much manual labor to pull this down the rows and have to go back to mechanized um, implement with the BCS. Okay, next slide. So when I think about purchasing tools and equipment, uh, sort of the, the big bullets I think about are first and foremost, you know, does the investment fit within the context of my whole farm plan and what I'm managing towards? And then I want to know if the investment is scale appropriate, both in terms of my current and future needs, which we had just talked about. I want to know what does it cost to own and operate? How easy is it to find parts, maintain and repair? And how safe and comfortable am not only am I using it, but other users on the farm as well, uh, whether it's my wife or if we have uh, staff or farm workers. Um, so, so when I think about this too, is you know how many people are going to be using the equipment uh, is really important to think about. And then my favorite one is you know do we really need it? You know where, are we investing in the weak link on our farm or is this more of something we just really kind of want? Um, so you know really going again back to that whole farm plan and really understanding what is that weak link. Um, that's preventing me from managing towards my goals uh, and, and understanding if what I am considering in terms of tools and equipment, um, you know, is that going to help me manage towards that or, you know, you know, do I really need it? And just looking at this picture of the tractor here, um, sort of the old trike tractor, there's a lot of them around, but there's also a reason why uh, they're not made anymore. Um, that's because you look at the center of gravity, um, they're, they're pretty unsafe, particularly on uh, hilly land. Um, so these were really popular at one point, and uh, now it's you can only find them used because uh, due to safety reasons, um, they, they don't make them anymore. All right, next slide. So thinking about um, starting off with hand tools and again, sort of going through that process of, of looking at what's available at the tractor scale and how do we get that down to the, the smaller scale or mid scale, it really comes down to Durability and ergonomics, you know, how is a tool designed and how is it made? Um, so looking at this picture here is um, a dibble, which I think someone put in the chat earlier. Uh, so on the left hand side is one for a tractor mounted. So this is poking holes in the ground for, for plants to go in. Uh, the center picture there is one I use. It's, you know, I'm bent over on my hands and knees and punching holes in the ground. That thing's only about a foot long. Uh, and then you have the picture on the right hand side, which is my nephew, who's a vegetable farmer. Uh, he's also six foot nine. And uh, when he used to come to our farm when he was growing up, you know, we kept telling him to uh, really focus more on the livestock, but he, he was pretty certain he wanted to get into vegetable growing, um, to which, you know, ergonomics played a, a critical role and still does. Um, so in looking at, you know, instead of being hunched over and poking holes in the ground with a dibble, he took a piece of angle iron and some wooden handles and cut out some, um, some of the, the dibbles, so he's got three of them on the angle iron just attached by wing nuts. 
So he can, he can move those along for his row spacing and, you know, it, it fits his body, it fits his needs. And so he's not hunched over, he's staying straight, his back straight, and uh, he's able to move efficiently up and down his rows, uh, all for probably under $20. All right, next slide. All right, so this I, I like to include, um, I guess I'll ask you all if, uh, we feel free to unmute yourselves or use the chat, but uh, do you all see anything wrong with this picture? Anything stick out to you? The tool in the middle. The tool in the middle. That's Want to explain a little bit further? I don't believe that's a yard tool. It looks like a roofing tool to me. Okay. Yep. So I see. So we have a uh, possibly the wrong tool in the in the ad. We have price. A couple of people said price. Anyone want to uh, elaborate on what they mean by price? Assuming twenty nine ninety nine is that a starting at? Okay, Rex is saying it doesn't show how long the handles are. Made in the USA. A lot of folks like to point that out. Well, for the sake of time, uh, we could get into the handles and the design and the steel and how they're attached, which is really important in terms of quality tools versus uh, what I would say is on the on the cheaper end that if something breaks, you generally have to throw it away. Um, but for a few more dollars, you can get a higher quality tool that uh, should last you a lifetime. Um, but I'm going to agree. I believe that was Tim who mentioned the tool in the middle as a roofing tool. Uh, I believe you are correct. And I'm also going to point out the tool on the left hand side. Uh, is a tool designed for mixing cement or concrete. Um, so there is no bevel on that hoe. Uh, and interestingly, you do find it in the yard tool section or garden section at a, at a hardware store. Um, but these tools are, are not designed for gardening or agriculture. Um, but I do think, again, it just sort of shows that disconnect we have, uh, particularly in this country. All right, next slide. I know I've only got a few minutes here to finish up. So I just wanna first point you to a few resources, particularly on the smaller scale for, for hand tools. Um, there is a webinar on the Atro website that I did several years ago, but it's a general introduction to hand tools. So it really dives into more of understanding the handle um, to head design components and considerations. And then also there is a publication uh, we may be able to put in the chat for you that uh, I wrote in 2011, again, a general introduction to tools and equipment for small scale intensive crop production that really, again, gets into a lot of what we're talking about today. Um, while noting that Omar, who you're gonna hear from here in a few moments, uh, and I are updating this publication. So by the end of the year, early next year, we hope to have uh, an updated version of this um, to which at the end, there is a directory of suppliers. Um, it's not, uh, you know, it's not everyone out there, but it is a, a pretty, Good list to get you started to understanding uh, who's out there for, for quality tools uh, based on design and ergonomics. And so some of the suppliers I like to point out, which are on the right hand side of your screen, um, Earth Tools, which is in Kentucky, they import a lot of European hand tools, as well as walk behind tractors, uh, BCS, as well as the only Gorillo uh, walk behind tractor dealer in the country. Johnny Selected Seas has a lot of great tools. Um, some of them sort of the, the signature series from Elliot Coleman. Um, but they're also now um, selling tools from a lot of uh, local farmers who are fabricating tools, um, as well as bringing in the TerraTech tools from France, which I'm super, uh, super, been super pleased with. But these last three I like to point out as well, Rogue Co is in the Midwest. They're taking old agricultural discs and uh, fabricating them into three-sided hose for cultivation, which is a really neat um, design. Green Heron is a group, uh, of women farmers out of Pennsylvania who did some research on how women use tools differently from men. 
And as a result, they've been able to come out with a, a small line of tools designed specifically for women in ergonomics, uh, including a, a quick hitch for a three-point hitch for a tractor. And then Red Pig, I also like to point out again, in terms of ergonomics and design, um, they've been around, I believe, since the 70s on the West Coast. They're out of uh, Washington State. Um, but they sort of looked at, you know, all these tools are designed for right-handed folks. Uh, so they were able to fabricate a whole line of tools for left-handed folks um, as well. All right, next slide. Just sort of finishing up here. I have to skip around. But, you know, again, thinking about scale of production, you know, we're at that smaller scale. But at some point, uh, as we're managing towards our goals, it may require some type of mechanization or scaling up to being mechanized, um, which again is often linked to expansion, um, but it's gonna have a big big component on, on cash flow and a farm's financial picture. And again, it should be closely tied to labor. So a lot of this is understanding, you know, how much investment you're putting into labor costs. And if I, instead, if I mechanize, what's that return on investment? How does that replace that labor? Uh, so there's a lot of sort of number crunching to do as we sort of mechanize or scale up our production. While also noting that a lot of farmers uh, have limited funds for capitalization efforts or are limited to taking on debt and just want to, you know, pay cash or, or utilize what they have in terms of cash flow um, to access equipment and tools. Next slide. So I think it's important too to understand that um, there's a lot more costs that go into just buying or purchasing a piece of equipment. Uh, so there is that capital investment uh, to which a, a friend of mine once told me that, you know, capital is fuel, that it's either going to propel you forward or it's going to blow you up. Uh, so again, it's sort of tying back into to what are your goals and values and, and what are you managing towards? But there's obviously operating costs, any storage costs related to building, possibly even taxes. Depreciation, we're not going to get into, but that's a big one, particularly for agriculture, because there are certain things you can depreciate over time that no other industry, according to the IRS, can, can utilize uh, as agriculture can. So it's really important to, to not only understand that, but all uh, the accounting aspects related to it, but also to work with an accountant who understands agriculture and what's required within the, the Schedule F, which is the, the tax form, your, your profit loss for, for a farm. There's the insurance components. There's investing in skills and knowledge. There's also the investment of being just a responsible uh, farmer with, with equipment. A lot of this is very dangerous stuff. There's a lot of moving parts and pinch points. So there's that responsibility aspect. But of course, we also get a lot of sa satisfaction out of it as well. Um, so there are ways such as a partial budget where we can sort of pencil things out before we, we purchase something just to see what that looks like in terms of our return on investment. What does it do in terms of our labor costs and whether or not financially it makes sense to invest in a piece of equipment. Next slide. All right, so um, one thing I do like to point out as well is there's always those unexpected costs that we just don't think about as we're doing our operating budget or looking at a partial budget to invest in a piece of equipment. Uh, so these can go into an operating budget as a, as a contingency line item. And in my experience, uh, that can be up to about 20% of your overall operating costs, which, which may seem high, but uh, you know, in my experience of taking all, uh, you know, your, your full operating budget and then including those costs for things that you just don't expect, which, you know, equipment is the big one, those expenses, those, those maintenance expenses, especially, you know, things break, particularly when you need them. Um, so making sure that we account for that in our budgets is really important. I've also worked with farmers who, instead of adding in a certain percentage of their overall operating expenses, will take a certain percentage of each piece of equipment that they're purchasing and add that to the to the operating budget. So for example, if I'm buying a $20,000 tractor, I may take $2,000 or 10% of the purchasing price and put that into my yearly operating costs just to cover that yearly maintenance and unexpected costs that, that I'm not accounting for in my budget. Next slide. All right, and then the other thing just to really think about is whether or not we have to own it. Uh, what are the options out there for possibly renting it or hiring it out? Um, are there lease options for equipment that require um, you know, some benefits over, over purchasing? But you know, just exploring what are my other options instead of just thinking about having to invest in the equipment, particularly if it's specialized and I may only be using it a few times a year or even once a year. 
Um, so I'm fortunate where I live, we have several uh, opportunities for equipment rental and equipment sharing. Uh, one is with a uh, small beginning farmers of New Hampshire, which is just a small nonprofit within the state that has an equipment rental uh, membership program, um, which, is, which is really great, both hand, hand scale tools as well as mechanized tools, as well as things for livestock as well. And our conservation districts here in the state uh, also have equipment rental programs really focused on soil health, um, both at the tractor scale, uh, as well as the walk behind scale. And uh, within the past few years, we've also been able to help start um, hand tool programs through uh, public libraries. Um, so folks can go to their public library, part of a maker space within them and, and get access to rent, I guess it's renting tools, um, you know, as they need. So again, just exploring what options are out there. And then next slide. Um, this is just sort of a, a simple way to sort of prioritize, um, you know, understanding what the costs are, both high and low. What are my options? Do, do I have to buy it? Is it new or used? But again, just really helping me prioritize where my investment should be and what that sort of looks like in terms of my cash flow. All right, so I'm going to skip ahead because I'm about out of time. But Margo, if you want to go next slide and then one more. I just also want to mention as we think about this, the importance of safety um, also related to investments in whether it's older equipment or newer equipment. Um, but you know, it's something to, to really consider, particularly if you have farm workers um, or other folks utilizing the equipment who may not be as familiar with it as you are. Um, but this is, this is really important. And the first is rollover protective structures, um, which all new tractors have to have. And where I live, we actually have regional um, cost share programs. So if you have a tractor that does not have a rollover protective structure, um, there are, is a program here to help cover that cost. I'm not sure if there's one on the West Coast, but something you may want to explore. Um, but you know, it just takes three, three fourths of a second to get to that, what they call the point of no return before a, a tractor can flip. Um, and side rollovers are, are a lot more common than, than the, um, the rollover you're looking at there. Um, but you know, with these ROP systems, rollover protective structures, uh, um, if you have one and you're wearing your seatbelt, they're 99% effective um, in keeping you safe. And the other one is a, a PTO shield, a power takeoff shield, which connects, you know, the takes energy from the engine to the, the power takeoff, which then feeds into the implement. So that's what, that, that's what powers the implement. And almost all implements operate at uh, 540 RPMs. Uh, there's a few that are a little bit less, but most of them operate at 540. And so at 540, that shaft is rotating nine times per second. And, um, you know, it's, it's a little too common, but I, you know, you may know someone who's been impacted by a, a PTO accident. Um, I know a good friend who was injured by one. I have another friend who lost his entire coveralls uh, in a spinning PTO shaft. Luckily he was, that's all he lost. Um, but, you know, for $80, you can get this shield uh, and it just, you know, makes it much more safer and protects you from this, from this moving part. All right, so um, the next few slides I'm going to pass over just because I'm out of time. Maybe we can come back to it if there's time at the end. But you know, happy to talk to you all individually. Um, if you have questions or interests, um, differences between buying new versus used or leasing versus buying equipment. But I just want to finish up with um, Margo. If you can go one more slide, the importance of also having a manual. Um, there is so much good information in manuals, um, whether you're talking about a 40 year old piece of equipment or a new piece of equipment. Um, but if you don't have access to one, they're out there, they're on Amazon or wherever. Um, they can be pricey, uh, you know, $80, $100 is, is pretty common for an older tractor um, manual. But uh, it gives you just such important information in terms of maintenance, use, troubleshooting. And then I also just want to point out the importance of keeping a maintenance log. Uh, so that you know when things are performed on equipment, um, not only for your own purposes, but if you're looking to buy or sell equipment, um, knowing how things are updated and maintained is, is really important and also impacts the price. Um, and as you, I think you can hit enter there, Margo. You know, one thing I, I always do is when I'm changing the oil on the filter, I put the date and the hours on there just so it's visible and I know uh, right then and there instead of having to go to my records. Um, when things were last performed, which is really helpful. And I would also add is just to, to plan ahead for maintenance. Um, you know, whether you're charged, you, 
you know, if you're paying yourself by the hour or salary, um, or if you do custom work, it's really important, um, you know, instead of just getting on the tractor or using a piece of equipment and doing the, the job, um, there should be pre-checks involved and there should be post-checks as well, as well as routine maintenance. And, and that, you know, that's time and, and time is money. So I would say the more we can plan ahead is, is ideal, but also making sure we account for that time. So if I'm thinking I may uh, cultivate carrots, which will take a half hour, uh, I may add in an additional 15 minutes, both uh, to cover the pre and post maintenance checks as well. So unfortunately, um, I had some more slides just to cover specific sort of the cutting edge tools that uh, you know I'm familiar with and working with. But it uh, looks like I'm about out of time. So Mark, if you just want to go to the last slide. And I'm happy to share this presentation with anyone as well. So just sort of finishing up, um, as we think about our decision-making processes for tools and equipment and as related to our design of our farm systems, is to use our whole farm plan and what we're managing towards to help filter and, and make these decisions. Uh, it's important to understand scales of production, both for now as well as in the future of, of where we're at, and that we should be prepared to invest in equipment. As I mentioned, some farmers are adverse to taking on debt and, and just want to pay cash or utilize cash flow. Um, but I think as we scale up, it's important and it's okay to, to embrace some debt, knowing that we expect a return on investment to help us manage towards our, our targeted revenue and, and what our goals are. And as I just sort of mentioned too, you know, weigh all your options before investing. Are there rental programs out there? Are there opportunities to share equipment with other farmers? Um, while noting that, you know, within these programs, um, everyone sort of needs the, the same piece of equipment at the same time. So there could be some logistics involved. Um, but, you know, it's, you know, that can be worked out versus having to invest in a expensive piece of equipment, especially if it's very specialized. And just in closing, uh, you know, to allow for change as well, that, you know, some things works and some things don't. But, you know, this is a great opportunity to, to focus on those systems that, you know, to, to change them so that they best work for you and, and to allow you to manage towards your goals. So on that note, um, I'm going to turn things over to Omar, who's going to talk about some of the programs in California and some resources. Um, and then we can come back if there's time for a question and answers. Thanks, Andy. That was great. Um, I'll, I'll try and be pretty quick so that maybe you can, you know, share those other innovative tools with your presentation as well. Um, let me just share my screen real quick. Can you all see the presentation? Yes, we can see yep. that. All right. Yeah, so I'll just be going briefly, like um, Andy mentioned, through a few of the resources out there, some of them California specific, um, others kind of, you know, applicable for anyone. Um, let's see here. Anthony mentioned the, or sorry, Andy, Andy mentioned the equipment and tools publication that we're updating. Um, the one to your far, to the far right is also being updated. Um, the soil moisture monitoring, low cost tools and methods. Um, a good pub if you are interested in kind of what's available kind of um, in the industry. The, the new publication does have a lot of additions though. So, and that one should be available, you know, within the next month or two. Um, Aside from these publications here, we also have two very good um, pamphlets, um, the micro irrigation pocket guide and the irrigators pocket guide. They have a bunch of information on troubleshooting, general maintenance, tables and fillable worksheets, um, water conservation, that sort of thing. So just kind of a great resource. <clears throat> Um, we also have an equipment section on, on the actual website itself that has all of these uh, publications, as well as a video series on maintaining your tractor and some other things like um, uh, chainsaw safety and that sort of thing. Coming up here in the next couple of years, we're hosting a, a few field days, um, two in California, 
one in Washington and one in Oregon. Um, we're going to be basically demonstrating and um, allowing for opportunity to to use these tools on in a farm setting. Um, and mo most of these tools are going to be geared towards kind of like the smaller farm scale, so maybe less than five acres. Um, at UC Santa Cruz, there's a chance we'll be doing kind of um, a little bit larger scale demonstrations, maybe a roller crimp crimper, things like that. Um, so those will be coming and we'll be posting um, these events as they approach on our events page. Um, oh, um, if you happen to be a tinkerer, um, a blacksmith, a welder, um, whatever it may be, CAF is, you know, um, a partner organization that's hosting this small farm innovation challenge. Um, anyone is welcome to apply. I mean, the, the, due, the due date for the application is coming up quickly this year, but um, as far as I know, it'll be an ongoing thing. So for any tinkerers out there or inventors, kind of share what you've developed and, you know, just get it out there. Anthony, Anthony, I keep saying Anthony. Andy uh, already mentioned a few of these uh, uh, resources for tools. Um, I didn't include too many uh, bro uh, tool brokers, um, but so these are kind of fabricators and um, things like that. Um, yesterday's tractors offers kind of, this is kind of older equipment. Um, I think they even have forums on there so you can chat with people. Um, they also help, help source um, specific parts and things for older tractors. Um, he's a tool and hardware company. They specialize in Japanese handcrafted Japanese tools um, for gardening and, and, and such. Um, and I believe Rogue Ho and Red Pig were already mentioned in the previous presentation. Um, let's see. Never, Never Sink, Four Season, and Johnny's. They have a bunch of different tools. Um, if you're interested in the green bot, uh, the green bot, the cool bot, for example, um, you can find that at Four Season Tools. Um, otherwise, they have a whole bunch of kind of innovative tools for the small farm. And then last year, Agribility, they have databases and um, um, basically tools for, for people uh, with disabilities. Um, some of them, um, you can search by tool, you can search by, um, by need, and they can connect with fabricators or even just kind of um, ideas that you can modify yourself. Let's see. Um, and last, we have Equip. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with EQIP, um, it's a program run by NRCS um, to help implement conservation practices on farms. Um, so the, the kind of practices listed there on the bottom right aren't available everywhere um, since the practices allowable are um, regional um, based off of the conservation need. Um, but for example, um, in California and in, in certain counties, there's a air quality initiative that allows for tractor replacement, kind of, you know, um, switching to cleaner, cleaner burning tractors and, and equipment, things like that. Um, but other popular um, practices are the high tunnels um, and micro irrigation, things like that. Uh, as it were, um, Rex, who was on this call, is a technical service provider, so he's pretty well suited to answering questions about EQIP. Let's see. And that's it. Um, if there's any questions, I think um, Andy and I will be happy to field those. Great. Omar and Andy, thank you both for a very information dense presentation. And I just, um, I have a, I think a question for Andy. Um, <clears throat> and so being a boomer, I think there's a, a point in time when saving a lot of labor and bending over would be a priority, more of a priority in the equipment decision process. And have you, 
Have you noticed, Andy, as you age, uh, that your decision-making process has evolved in, in that direction? <laughs> That's a great question, Rex. Um, I would say no overall. Um, I think, though, that Omar pointed out a few resources that, that could relate to your question, one being agribility. Um, and I should mention, too, that that program is run through usually um, a land-grant university per state, which, um, but not every state has an agribility program connected to extension. Um, so I don't know if California or West Coast states have them. Um, but if they do, it's, I think it sort of ties into what you're saying, Rex, as they are thinking about tool design, not only for um, physical disabilities, but I would say um, you know, even just things like arthritis. Um, so they're, they're creating new types of handles for hand tools, things like that, um, with sort of, I would say, the aging sort of ailments. Um, Easter Seals, they, they've partnered with Easter Seals quite a bit on some of these, uh, I would say, gardening tool design for ergonomics. Um, but I also think your question sort of also leads into um, sort of the technologies on the other end of more computerized systems, um, you know, sort of the, the high tech tools and equipment component, uh, which, you know, is very up and coming. There's a lot of new devices out there and systems to operate farms uh, and manage equipment, but um, I don't know, maybe that's, maybe I am older than I, <laughs> than I think. <laughs> well, um, I think perhaps maybe you could go back to some of the slides we missed and uh, just discuss some of those equipment options? Sure, I can do this quickly and then folks wanna, yeah, feel free just to ask questions too. Um, I can just sort of go through some of the cutting edge technologies that I find useful, um, both in terms of our, our farm as well as farmers I work with throughout the country. Um, so sort of going back to um, appropriate technologies on this slide, um, You'll see quite a few of them with a, the, the cordless drill. One is the tilther in the center, um, which is from Johnny's. And then uh, on the right-hand side is a greens harvester that's run by a 18 volt drill. Um, that being said, it was interesting. So when Margo and I were in Baltimore, I think every farm we went to the greens harvester um, was mentioned as the farm's favorite tool. Um, however, I did a workshop last week in Massachusetts and uh, the farmer mentioned that this was one of the worst bought buys he purchased for his farm. Um, so it, what he said was, you know, really related to having a very clean operation with no weeds um, so that, you know, you can go through and cut and, and harvest quickly. But, you know, if it's not that clean of a system, you're ending up having to spend a lot of time picking through and dealing with weeds and other things. So again, you know, what works on one farm doesn't always work on, on another farm. Um, the picture in the upper left is a cultocycle. This was designed uh, for my friend Dorn, um, also as part of a group called Farm Hack, which Omar, you had mentioned this sort of California idea of sharing tool ideas and designs. Farm Hack is a great resource of open source designs where you can go online or to one of their, their functions and um, comment on tools, share ideas, share blueprints, um, but also utilize them. So this was a, a bike powered cultivator. Um, so they basically took the width of the bed so you can change your tires to the width of your bed. And then there's a cultivating bar um, that you can add different implements to. The bottom left-hand picture is a Tilly, which is a West Coast um, carton tools, which is a company out of the West Coast. Um, and that was designed instead of the tilther, which is really designed just for a light incorporation of amendments or compost before planting. It's not designed for tilling for like weed control or initial bed prep. Um, the Tilly is um, a battery packed system designed more for cultivation. He wanted to originally figure out how he can cultivate between corn um, at a smaller scale. And so that's how he came up with that design. Um, I'm going to skip the middle one for a moment, but the bottom right hand picture, Rex, I believe that's a picture you sent me from a farm in California. Uh, again, sort of going back to the definition of an appropriate technology. This is the open wheel cultivating tractor, the original one, the Alice Chalmers G. Um, which was manufactured uh, 1949 to 51-ish. Uh, they quit making them. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a, uh, quite a few supply uh, manufacturers now sort of redesigning this, this type of open wheel tractor for cultivation so that you actually see what's below you versus having to, to look behind you and, and, and you know, hurt your neck. 
Um, but this one specifically was uh, the engine was taken off and it was made into a battery powered unit. And those uh, plans are actually online for free um, that uh, a farmer out of New York came up with. So you, um, how to take the engine off and how to uh, make it electric. Um, so you can look that up as well. Um, but I also like that picture in the middle, the bottom middle. Um, I think one of the big missing pieces within our equipment toolbox in this country is for grains harvesting, small scale grains harvesting. Um, so a lot of what we do have is all imported um, from overseas, including this unit, which is actually from China. Um, it's called the Boaz. So it comes in uh, two, four, or seven foot heads, uh, depending on what crop you're, you're looking to, to harvest. Um, they do make a bigger unit. However, um, the engine does not meet EPA admissions standards. Um, so we did have one um, that we got to mess around with for about two years in this country before we had to send it back, but that's because we had a research license on it. So the idea was to, to bring in this equipment, understand how it's designed, and then figure out how we can refabricate it here uh, in this country. But uh, again, I think that's a big missing piece of our equipment toolbox that uh, I'm looking forward to seeing a lot more interest and involvement in, in small scale grain production. Next slide. I'll go through a, uh, a few here. Um, tools for managing cover crops and sort of leading into no-till production. Again, sort of looking at that big scale going down to the hand scale. Um, so the upper right is the roller crimper uh, designed for tractor use. Um, so this is a way for no-till production to, to kill a cover crop before planting your cash crop into it. Um, and some farmers are able to put the roller crimper on the front of a tractor and a no-till planter on the back. So it's one pass through the field before harvest. Um, well, I will say research is showing in organic systems, um, tillage is still required after four to six, seven years um, for weed control. But sort of scaling back, you know, as I think about cover crops and the importance they play in these systems, um, the big question is, you know, how do you manage cover crops? So before choose selecting which cover crops to use and how to utilize them is, is you know, how are you gonna manage them? Um, and so one of the tools that I, I find most effective for a walk behind tractor is a flail mower, which is the upper, upper left-hand picture. Um, so, you know, you can use different types of, of mowers for, for managing cover crops. A lot of them, you know, if you're cutting a grass, it's going to grow back. So that's where this roller crimper comes in because it's crimping and, and killing um, the species. Um, but a flail mower really chops it up fine, uh, which is just a really nice tool for, for going in then for planting. And hey Andy, let me make a comment on the flail mower because uh, one year I planted a bunch of mustard in my back orchard. Uh, it's a small one acre orchard. And, uh, it got about six or seven feet tall and uh, I leased, I just rented a flail mower, a small rock behind flail mower. And it worked fine on the shorter stuff, on the grassy, kind of the a different cover crop that I had. But for those taller, um, mustards it I had to clean it out I had to stop and clean it out about every 15 feet because uh, oh, wow. it just didn't digest the um those those tall um stocks huh so that's interesting because the bottom right hand picture is a, a rye cover crop and that is the roller crimper for a bcs um which works okay um, but we also used a flail mower on that same crop and it worked wonderful um, I'm guessing the small grain had smaller stems. I mean, these, these mustards were monsters, you know, uh, they were like um, inch, inch or two in diameter. So, so other tools though, for, for cutting though, there's the rotary mowers, which will push everything to one side. So you got to figure out how to manage that. Um, sickle bar mowers, which chop the stalks at the base are really great. Um, great for fence lines too, but, uh, Somewhat of a dangerous tool, requires a lot of making sure the bolts are tight every time. Uh, and then at the hand scale, I have a picture of a broad fork, which um, there's several different models out there. Um, but this is again, an opportunity to aerate the soil without inverting the soil, such as tillage. Um, and you'll see designs now with either sort of a serrated blade tine versus a rounded tine. And that really relates to the type of soil you have. If it's more clay or a heavy soil, you want more of the serrated knife-like tines. Um, I prefer more of the rounded tines. Um, a lot of it is, you know, just really trying to think about mimicking 
earthworms and what's happening in the soil. And, I, and with my soils, uh, I do much better sort of with the, with the rounded tines. Um, but that center picture is sort of, you know, if your roller crimping is making sure that, that there's a mat and that's all laid in one direction. Otherwise, you're going to have a very difficult time planting into it. Um, hey, Andy, just a, a quick interruption here. Uh, Melissa uh, asks, uh, any suggestion on a smaller scale no-till drill and roller crimper uh, to use on a small tractor? The local soil conservation district only have ones for larger tractors. So a smaller scale, it looks like you, ha you had a roller crimper on that walk behind tractor, eh? Yeah, that's the only one I know of. Um, it's from Earth Tools. Um, so it's not BCS specific or, or manufactured by BCS or an Italian company, but it's uh, Joel at Earth Tools fabricated it himself. Um, and there are some differences. So with the larger scale ones, you generally fill the crimper with water for added weight, which is really important. Um, on the smaller scale one, you don't do that, but you add, add weights to it. So there's pins coming out the side where you can add um, regular weights to it. But that, that added weight is really important to get that good crimp. Um, otherwise, particularly rye or, or vetch can, can grow back. Um, but that's the only one I know of at, at sort of that smaller scale. Um, all right, so uh, here's a slide of sort of planting. A um, couple options here. The upper left is the earthway cedar, sort of the traditional market gardener tool. It's been around a long time, very affordable. Uh, and it uses these discs to plant um, what I would say is sort of your, your spacing, um, while also noting you can mark your ro next row. You can see the uh, row marker out there as you're planting. Um, but if you go to the upper right, there's the Jang Cedar out of Korea. And this has just been on the market uh, a few years now. Um, but I would say this is sort of the, the Cadillac of, of push cedars, um, over $300. And it uses rollers instead. Um, but the precision on it is much, is, is pretty amazing, particularly for smaller seeds and greens. Um, so I still use an earthway for bigger seeds and also for planting cover crop. Um, but when I really need to get down to detail in terms of precision seeding, um, the Jang is, is just amazing. There's the paper pot transplanter in the bottom left, um, which is a great tool for, for uh, transplanting crops that uh, you have to start within the same sort of system to feed the transplanter. So it can get quite expensive. It's over $1,000, it's out of Japan. Um, but a really great tool and um, just sort of heard recently that it's, um, it hasn't been allowed in organic production because of the glue that's used in the, in the, the pots um, that you can see sort of strung out there next to the paper pot transplanter. Um, but I did hear recently that, that um, the NOP is going to vote to possibly change that so it can be used in organic production. Um, the center picture is my new tool. I just got it this week and I've only used it once, but again, it's uh, battery drill powered. Um, this is just like the Tilther from Johnny's, but this is from Neversink Farm out of New York, which Omar uh, shared with you in his slides. Uh, so Connor Crickmore is uh, sort of fabricating tools now um, and he uses a lot of it based on the paper pot transplanter, but this is uh, just like the Tilther designed um, to sort of incorporate amendments and sort of do bed prep. Um, through battery power from a drill, um, but not tillage. And then that bottom right picture, uh, sort of just going back to no-till, that's sort of the tractor scale no-till transplanter. Um, there's also drills and for direct seeding, um, but here's when we got to work with, um, where two people got to ride on it. You feed, feed the plants into a chute, and so you're adding fertilizer and water and the plants all at the same time, which is going into that rye cover crop, which I showed um, using the roller crimper. Maybe we'll finish up with a couple of slides here. So yeah, just in terms of cultivation, you know, at the hand scale, um, I'd refer you to that webinar just to understand the, the tool design, um, really understanding the steel components, how the head and the handle attach to each other is really important. And then sort of moving along to uh, sort of wheel hose, um, which are just a little bit more efficient. Um, you know, I really like using it. It's taken away from uh, having a gym membership um, so I'm out there with wheel hoe a lot. And if you go to the next slide, this is uh, one we have now too. This is from TerraTech and they have different models. But uh, what I really like about this one is it's again, taking that larger scale implements for cultivation and applying it to a manual scale. So there's a toolbar on the back that you can add different attachments to. 
um, which most of them, again, are, are mimicking what's at the tractor scale. So the, the left, you know, there's some tine weeders. Uh, in the center picture, there's some finger weeders, which is a pretty well-known implement for tractor-mounted equipment. Um, but yeah, just a really neat opportunity to, to put these at the, at the smaller scale. Yeah, maybe we'll finish up with a, one more slide here or some, see what's up. Yeah, and um, I think some of the game changers too on a smaller scale are flame weeding and tarping, um, but they require a lot of, um, you know, getting your systems down. Um, so flame weeding, you really have to understand uh, the timing of it in order for it to work well. And um, there's different types of flamers out there. This is one I got to work with. Uh, you can see Elliot Coleman in the background there. Um, but um, taking sort of this roller and, and attaching a flamer to it to just to be more efficient, um, sort of what we're working on with that design. And then tarping, uh, I know on the West Coast, you all do a lot more solarization, um, which we don't have enough sun and heat to, to do that here on the East Coast. So we use silage tarps, which are much more heavier. Uh, we put them down for several weeks. And, um, you know, for us, it's really, you know, a game changer because you can put down compost. Um, you can see in the bottom picture, we had biochar down. Um, but, you know, we had it down for several weeks and then we pull it off and we're actually able to, to go right in and plant. Um, so it does require a lot of moving of sandbags and, and these tarps can be heavy. Ours are 24 by 100. Um, but in terms of a, a, an efficient system, low cost, um, just a, a really great way to get um, to get your beds ready. All right. So yeah, there's just a, a few slides on some of the equipment we use and that I've worked with other farmers. I feel again, it's, you know, taking what's, what's at that larger scale and how can we apply it to, to a smaller scale is just really interesting. And we're finally seeing some, some manual tools and equipment coming in that, that's really focused on those efficiencies. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, before we go, I'm gonna launch a poll, um, a few evaluation questions. So let us know um, what you thought about today's session and give us some feedback. And um, I put it in the chat, but we will be sending out a recording of today's session as well as Andy and Omar's slides and some of the uh, publications and webinars and things that we mentioned, we'll make sure we include all of those links. So um, it will probably be tomorrow or the next day once we get the recording um, uploaded and, and cleaned up, we will share that with, with everybody. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone and, and thanks Rex, Omar, and Margo for, for having me on today. And um, if you all have any questions, please don't hesitate to, to give me a call or shoot me an email. I'd love to always love to chat tools and equipment and see how we can learn together. Yeah, thank you, Andy, and thank you, Omar and Margo. And please do fill out that uh, evaluation. That helps us uh, improve the presentations and uh, gives us more direction as to your information needs and where you're coming from. So uh, thanks everybody and don't forget, uh, same time, same station next week, investing in your soils. That's uh, an important piece of equipment, if you will, on your farm. And it um, also has off farm impacts as well. So um, I'll be talking about that. And uh, as Andy mentioned, uh, he manages his farm uh, in a large part uh, towards soil health. I mean, you want to make money for sure, but soil health is a way to actually ultimately reduce your input costs and um, well worth the effort. And um, also it's, there are uh, various programs, uh, especially out here in California that can really help you help support your soil health uh, efforts. So we'll be talking about that next week. Looks like it's about everybody's. Yep. What do we got? Yep, everybody. Thank you. All right. All right, folks, till next week. Um, thanks. 
everybody again, uh, really good presentation and really good information. I, I learned a lot today. Adios. <laughs>